I am Nicola Agostini, the representative of FIDH uh, to the UN in Geneva. And I thank you for attending this side event. I would like to thank the sponsors, the organizers, uh, Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain, ADHRB, and the sponsors, the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty, the Bahrain Institute for Rights and Democracy, uh, the Saudi Organization for Rights and Freedoms, Reprieve, FIDH, the European Saudi Organization for Human Rights, the European Center for Democracy and Human Rights, and Al Qust. Um, before we start, perhaps a disclaimer. I'd like uh, you to understand that we'd like only accredited media and organizers to take pictures and, and to film the event. And please, at the end, when we are in the questions and answers um, uh, phase, uh, please identify yourself and say it if you don't, don't want to be filmed. I am lucky to uh, moderate this panel today with uh, three uh, human rights defenders. Ali al Dubaisi from Saudi Arabia. He is the, uh, a Saudi human rights activist and the executive director of the Berlin-based European Saudi Organization for Human Rights. And he was previously a prisoner of conscience in Saudi Arabia during the Arab Spring. Maya Foa is the director of Reprieve's death penalty team and is responsible for overseeing the death penalty team strategy. And Hélène Dethoy from ADHRB she is an advocacy associate at ADHRB working on Saudi human rights abuses. A few words of introduction on Saudi Arabia. Why this event? Saudi Arabia went from a discrete diplomacy that used to work behind the scenes to uh, asserting, asserting a very aggressive role uh, in international fora, including here at the Human Rights Council. So from being behind the scenes, it went to being under the spotlight at the Human Rights Council here. And I'm referring, of course, to the role Saudi Arabia plays in the Human Rights Council on thematic resolutions and thematic initiatives, on freedom of religion or belief, and the attempts to revive the defamation of religion agenda, but also now on thematic resolutions on human rights defenders, on women's rights, and so on and so forth. But I'm also referring to what happened at the last session with discussions on Yemen and the fact that Saudi Arabia was able to defeat a resolution, a draft resolution that proposed to create an international inquiry into violations committed by all parties to the conflict in Yemen. So we wanted to, shed, to shine a light on a specific issue of concern within Saudi Arabia, which is the use and overuse of the death penalty with a killing spree that has been witnessed especially last year and at the beginning of this year in Saudi Arabia. I will uh, ask the panelists a few questions and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll cover all of the issues related to the death penalty uh, and have some time at the end for questions and answers. So uh, without further ado I will ask perhaps Ellen to start with, with uh, facts on the death penalty in Saudi Arabia and what, what happened what, in terms of the, the killing spree that we have witnessed. What, what happened and how uh, was, the, was Saudi Arabia uh, able to uh, sentence that many people to the death penalty? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Nicola, and thank you all for being here today. As I'm sure you're all aware at this point, in 2016, the government of Saudi Arabia executed 47 people in a single day. Among those executed were at least three activists, mentally ill prisoners, and prisoners arrested for crimes that were allegedly committed when they were minors. The victim who's received the most attention, however, is Sheikh Nimr Bakr al Nimr. Sheikh Nimr was a cleric, a human rights activist, and a social justice activist who operated out of Saudi Arabia's eastern province for many years. He became popular for his speeches and sermons that criticized systematic discrimination against Saudi Arabia's minorities and called for justice and equality for all Saudi citizens. 
In February 2011, as protests spread across the Middle East, Saudi citizens took to the streets to demand the release of political prisoners and to call for political reform. Sheikh Nimr endorsed these protests. He called for political and religious reforms, denounced ongoing repression, and urged young protesters to use nonviolent methods to call for change. He repeatedly argued for the use of words rather than weapons, emphasizing that protesters must stay peaceful in the face of state violence. As protests continued, he became a leader of the movement. In June 2012, after the death of Crown Prince Nayef, Sheikh Nimr delivered a speech detailing the injustices committed by the Ministry of Interior. Just weeks later, on July 8, 2012, Saudi security forces violently detained Sheikh Nimr in an arrest that left him with multiple gunshot wounds. Over the course of the next few months, authorities did not allow Sheikh Nimr to speak freely with his family, and he did not receive proper treatment for the wounds that he sustained during his arrest. Eight months after the arrest, in March 2013, the Saudi judiciary began legal proceedings before the specialized criminal court, Saudi Arabia's terrorism tribunal. The government charged Sheikh Nimr with breaking allegiance with the ruler, inciting sectarian strife, supporting rioting, all in relation to his peaceful free speech. It further condemned Sheikh Nimr's sermons and speeches for disrupting unity, insulting the king, and calling for the overthrow of the ruling system. Despite this, Amnesty International reviewed his speeches and found that none of them had advocated for violent resistance to the government. Throughout the legal proceedings, the Saudi government repeatedly violated Sheikh Nimr's right to a fair trial. At times, the judge failed to notify Sheikh Nimr's defense team of his hearings. The defense team was not allowed to question eyewitnesses to the arrest, even though the judge accepted their testimony in writing, and the government appointed a new judge in the middle of the proceedings. Finally, in October of 2014, the judge sentenced Sheikh Nimr to death. UN human rights experts weighed in on his case on multiple occasions. In August of 2014, several special rapporteurs expressed concern that the legal proceedings in his case did not comply with international human rights standards. In 2014, they again reiterated their concern over the trial, as well as over allegations of torture and the lack of medical care in his case. Despite their comments and a wealth of other international pressure, on January 2, 2016, the government executed Sheikh Nimr. The decision to execute Sheikh Nimr, a peaceful human rights and social justice activist, shows that Saudi Arabia is not afraid to carry out executions that will be internationally condemned. Sheikh Nimr's execution and the mass execution that claimed 46 other lives on the same day represent two parts of the same troubling trend. Saudi Arabia is executing more people. It's not only executing more people in terms of sheer numbers, it is executing more people in terms of the supposed types of offense that they have committed. In fact, Saudi Arabia's mass execution was just another benchmark in a trend that has been growing for years. The execution rate has soared since 2010. From a low of 27 executions in that year, every year for the past five years has seen more than 70 executions in Saudi Arabia. The past two years has seen an even further escalation. In 2014, the government executed 90 people. In 2015, the government executed 158 people. Two days into 2016, it had already executed 47 people. Today, less than two and a half months into 2016, that number already stands at 70. The Human Rights Council has raised the use of the death penalty with Saudi Arabia many times. In December 2013, member states of the HRC submitted 225 recommendations to Saudi Arabia as part of Saudi Arabia's second cycle universal periodic review of human rights. In February 2014, Saudi Arabia accepted 189 of those recommendations, or 84%. Of the 14 recommendations related to the abolition of the death penalty, however, the government outright rejected nine recommendations and fully accepted only one recommendation, a recommendation that was related to transparency in judicial proceedings. In other words, the government outright rejected 64% of recommendations related to the death penalty. Of the recommendations that Saudi Arabia partially accepted, several related to the abolition of the death penalty for minors. In accepting these recommendations, Saudi Arabia claimed that the practice was already abolished under Saudi law. This is not true. Under Saudi law, a judge decides whether a defendant is showing signs of puberty at the time of his trial, not at the time that the offense was committed. If the judge decides that he is, he can treat the child as an adult through the proceedings. 
Through this method, children have been sentenced to death as young as 13 years old. In 2014, the SCC, or the Terror Court, sentenced three men to death for crimes reportedly committed under the age of 18, all in relation to their protest activity. These men still sit on death row today and could be executed at any time. The government also partially accepted a recommendation to reconsider its use of capital punishment and to establish alternatives to the death sentence. Instead, the government has continued to impose the death penalty for a wide variety of both violent and nonviolent crimes. Nonviolent crimes that carry the death sentence include adultery, apostasy, drug-related offenses, witchcraft, and sorcery. In 2014, Saudi Arabia executed at least 31 persons for nonviolent crimes, more than the total number of people that it executed in 2010. The government also accepted a recommendation to bring greater transparency into judicial proceedings involving capital punishment. However, proceedings have remained far from fair and open. In death penalty cases, the government has failed to provide defendants consistent access to counsel, commenced hearings in secret, and commonly held detainees in indefinite and incommunicado detention. Judges can choose to close hearings under what they term exceptional circumstances, which include security reasons, morality, or if a judge deems that closure of the hearing could be necessary to find the truth. Furthermore, the SCC, Saudi Arabia's Terrorism Court, commonly adjudicates death penalty cases, and the SCC has expansive authorities to conduct trials in secret and in the absence of the accused. Since 2014, the SCC has sentenced a number of people to death after secret legal proceedings, including seven young protesters from the eastern province. Three of these men were killed on January 2nd, 2016. These facts and patterns demonstrate that Saudi Arabia has not taken the recommendations of the international community seriously. Rather than work to establish alternatives to the death penalty, Saudi Arabia has markedly increased its use of the death sentence. Progress on the few death penalty related recommendations from the international community has remained almost completely null. As a member of the council, this trend is acutely problematic. Saudi Arabia is displaying a disregard for its duty to uphold the human rights of its citizens. This trend must be addressed in order to stop the arbitrary deprivation of life in Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Len, for this uh, overview. And uh, I, I should say that there are reports available outside on the implementation of re UPR recommendations by Saudi Arabia. It's a report by ADHLB and, and BERT. The, the fact that Saudi Arabia perhaps doesn't abide by international standards in relation to the death penalty. We heard about minors, we heard about the imposition of the death penalty for non-serious crimes. Could you perhaps tell us a bit more, Maya? Sure, yes. Oh, is that on? Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this very distinguished panel. Um, so first, just an a, a overview to add to what Ellen was saying. We've been studying, uh, analyzing some of the trends in the death penalty in Saudi Arabia. We work there and, and elsewhere in the world. It's important, I think, to note that Saudi Arabia is the fourth top executing country in the world at this point after Iran, China, and Pakistan. And that if they continue to execute at the rate that they're executing at right now, Ellen said 70 people so far, we will see more than 350 executions carried out by the end of the year. Of those facing execution in Saudi Arabia, 72% we believe to have been sentenced to death for non-violent offences, which includes, of course, attendance at political protests and drug offences. 69% of those executed in the past year had been sentenced to death for non-violent offences. And among those facing execution are prisoners who were sentenced to death as children, such as Mohammed al-Nimr, Dawood Hussein al-Mahun. Ellen mentioned this, but the use of torture to extract confessions is widespread. We've identified specific cases where prisoners have been beaten to the point of suffering broken bones and teeth. And execution methods include beheading, stoning, and beheading combined with crucifixion. While the majority of executions, as we say, are for drug offences, and this is on the rise, it is important, of course, to note that the Saudi government is increasingly using death sentences and executions as a political tool, which marks a bit of a shift in the kingdom's application of the death penalty. In many of these cases, non-violent individuals who have simply spoken out against the Saudi government are executed with the intention, of course, of sending a clear message, in Saudi Arabia, if you speak out, you will be killed. 
Perhaps the best known case is that of Sheikh Nimr al-Nimr, who was the Shia cleric Alan just mentioned, executed on January the 2nd. But the phenomenon is really widespread in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Numerous young Saudis have been sentenced to death for the mere crime of participating in political protest. And I say crime in inverted commas. The rise in executions is mirrored by an increase in rhetoric from uh, Saudi Arabian authorities who justify the executions on national security and counter-terrorism grounds. The 47 executed on the 2nd of January were all described by the Saudis as terrorists, despite most of them being entirely innocent of any crime that would fit the definition of terrorism. Indeed, more and more frequently we're seeing dissenting speech of any kind labelled terrorist activity. And that's important in relation to the way the international community responds to what we are seeing in Saudi Arabia right now, which is something I'm going to come on to shortly. We've also observed a sharp rise in the number of death sentences emerging from the specialised criminal, criminal courts. I won't go into that as Ellen's already spoken about it, but suffice it to say uh, this is a court where uh, that's responsible for uh, more of the human rights abuses that we see in, in the Saudi system. It's under the purview of the Ministry of Interior, which is directly responsible for the systemic torture within Saudi detention uh, facilities. We have another example of a guy called Mohammed al Shuk, who was executed on January 2nd for protest related, related offences. He was brutally tortured into confessing to crimes he hadn't committed. He was denied access to legal counsel and convicted solely on the base of a coerced confession. And this pattern in which individuals are targeted for speech, free speech, in which they're not allowed to call a lawyer, they're tortured into confessing and they're convicted of terrorism related charges on the basis of the confession is not an outlying example but very much closer to the norm in uh, death penalty cases. Of course um, there is a particular point of concern in the execution of juveniles that we've heard about. We now know that among the 47 executed on the 2nd, there were at least four individuals who were children when their alleged offences took place. One of them was 13 years old when he was arrested. That was Mustafa Abka. He had been arrested in a raid launched by Saudi authorities targeting Al-Qaeda militants. He was subsequently sentenced to death for joining a terrorist organisation. Now, although the Saudi authorities publicly acknowledged that Mustafa had been recruited as a child soldier for Al-Qaeda, they failed to recognize his juvenility in the court system. And that is uh, something that we found to be prevalent. Despite the existence of separate court circuits for trying juveniles, juvenility in Saudi death penalty cases, and especially terrorism cases, is often completely ignored. Uh, Juveniles are also victims to the same torture and due process violations that we've seen in other cases and are frequently tried alongside adults and executed in contravention of international law and domestic Saudi law. Reprieve's work on uh, these execution cases. We work extensively on the death penalty in Saudi Arabia and around the world and we tend to focus our work on cases where there are particularly egregious violations of international minimum standards. For example, the executions or the potential executions of the three juveniles, uh, Ali Dawood and Abdullah, which are still, they've been stayed but they could still occur at any time. And this enables us as an international NGO to effectively engage the international community in defense of these individuals. And this is pretty critical when it comes to Saudi Arabia and capital punishment. Of course, advocating on behalf of juveniles is only possible when we're aware of a detainee's juvenility. Unfortunately, the opacity of the Saudi legal system means that sometimes human rights advocates are unaware that individuals facing death are juveniles or that they committed their alleged crimes when they were children. This is what happened with the juveniles who were executed on January 2nd. Um, we are aware, when we are aware of uh, juveniles facing execution, as in the cases of Ali al-Nima, Dawood al-Mahun and Abdullah Zahir, Reprieve works alongside other NGOs and rights defenders to investigate the cases, to provide legal advice and assistance, which can include anything from submitting complaints to international bodies and helping draft submissions to domestic bodies, depending on the case in point. We also undertake more broad-based broad advocacy intended to bring international media attention to the cases and to achieve intervention by foreign governments and supranational bodies like the UN and the EU. With respect to Saudi Arabia, this aspect of the work is especially important. 
Of course, the ultimate goal in any individual case is to ach achieve a pardon or commutation of the death sentence, not just a de facto stay of execution. Accordingly, pushing actors with a lot of influence and clout in Saudi Arabia to discourage executions is one of the most important strategies we deploy. So one of the things about our organization is that based in London, we can engage publicly and privately with European member states who, of course, have a very close historical relationship with Saudi Arabia and strong links now to the Saudi regime, including the defense and security sectors. The UK, for example, in addition to approving billions in defense contracts to Saudi Arabia, provides extensive training and assistance packages to the kingdom's security sector. This close relationship means that often we see, unfortunately, the UK and other governments brushing over the kingdom's human rights abuses, or worse still, parroting the propaganda issued by the authorities. Philip Hammond, the uh, foreign minister in the UK, for example, responded to the outcry after the 47 executions in January, saying, let us be clear, these were all convicted terrorists despite the fact that many were executed for attending political protests and, and some were children. And you'll have seen uh, Hollande's recent awarding of the Légion d'honneur to Bin Nayef, the Minister for the Interior in Saudi Arabia, who is in charge of the security services which arrested the juveniles and in charge of the specialized criminal court which illegally tried and sentenced them to death on the basis of evidence extracted through torture. But this close relationship can also be leveraged to support the individuals at risk of execution in Saudi Arabia. And I'm going to give you an example that uh, comes from just this last year when in September 2015, the public outcry and campaigning from organizations like Reprieve in the UK forced the UK government to do a very public U-turn on a bid that they had to a contract with Saudi Arabian prison services. It was six million and they withdrew from the contract bid. The public interest in the case in Britain and the UK government's initial resistance to, to pulling out meant that there was an enormous amount of media and uh, public interest in Britain's stance on executions in Saudi Arabia. This was around the time when the three juveniles were uh, facing a potential imminent execution. This led to Prime Minister David Cameron being questioned on the issue on one of our most widely watched uh, news programs and saying that he opposed the executions in Saudi Arabia and those of juveniles and would continue to do so and try and find an opportunity to raise the cases with at the highest levels in Saudi Arabia. Those individuals were not, in fact, executed. Um, there was also a huge amount of international media on the cases and this was coupled with UN and EU condemnation and the work of global campaign and human rights activists like those sitting to my left. And, and we believe that that was fundamental in contributing to the fact that those three who are not out of the woods yet but have not been executed uh, were not part of the, the 47 on January 2nd. So real change can't be uh, achieved, of course, from, Saudi, from outside of Saudi Arabia alone. And creating a space for lawyers and activists, and we'll hear from one now, uh, in Saudi Arabia is, is absolutely vital so that we can have long-term strategies for change. But what we can do from here in Europe and elsewhere is to make sure that the need for such a space is internationally recognized and that where there are facts about serious human rights abuses like those in the cases of the juveniles Ali Abdullah and Dawood, where they come to light, they have as much support and scrutiny as possible. And we also need to continue to expose the hypocrisy and false narratives that some of our governments are knowingly or unknowingly employing to justify their silence about the uh, rights abuses in the Saudi Arabian Kingdom and to continue to bring ever pressure to bear on the Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, for this uh, very clear presentation. I'm turning now to Ali to uh, ask him to share with us his analysis of the situation with regard to the death penalty, in particular uh, trials, the judicial process and uh, lack of due process in terms of sentencing, prosecuting, judging and sentencing people to the death penalty. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank, thank you for all at attendance here. Uh, as a Saudi, I began attending the Human Rights Council since 2014. Attending a total of six sessions since that time, 
not more than four Saudis have attended openly. The last of the th th uh, the last of the of them in 2014 was Miss Samar Badawi, who, following her attendance at the consul, faced a travel ban investigation and ongoing harassment. I regret through my observation. It's clear that Saudi is taking the wrong approach and this is based on the following. First, the practice of lying uh, and discussion in their speech and reports. Uh, second, lack of interest in, fi in finding a positive relation and interactive dialogue with organization. In fact, it seems it considers them as enemies. Third, uses harassment to deal with critical speeches, uh, rather than positive engagement with them. Fourth, seek to keep civil society activists in Saudi away from the audience in the council and has succeeded with this to a large extent. As much as systematic violence of a human rights was concerned, the practice of misleading statements is also deeply disturbing because it confirms that violation cases are integrated and systematic. Saudi always offers uh, a, just, a justified uh, response to claims of violation, but often avoid discussion, uh, discussion details or any interactive direct dialogue with independent organizations that have the facts. Regarding uh, criticism direct toward execution, most notably the mass execution in the 2nd of Yanayar in which Sheikh Numer executed for his baseful demand for social, social justice. The response of the authorities is to claim he had a fair trial. There is a little time actually to discuss uh, regarding the question of Nicholas the unfairness of the trial in general. So, I will focus on the unfairness of the trial of execution victims in Saudi from among us political prisoners and prisoners of con consciences. We can investigate this by answering the question. What was the role of the lawyer during the trials of death penalty cases? I will answer this and 14 points. First, the deny cannot appoint a lawyer when he is b being held, uh, despite having the power of attorney prior of a lawyer not able to meet his client. Second, during the, prior, uh, during the period of investigation, there is no rule uh, at all for the lawyer. And often the period of investigation is also a period of torture. Furthermore, in one case, the judge is recorded as saying, and we have uh, the document here, I order a reinvestigation and torture him to a certain degree. This is from judge, not from investigation. This was in 3 September 2014. The third, after the investigation, which called last four days or weeks or month or year, or year, and before the start of the trial, the defendant is sent to the judge to approve the statement he made in investigation, and also without presence, support, or advice from a lawyer, they send him alone. Here, the det detainee is forced to sign the confessions. Uh, otherwise, he will be written back for further inter in interrogation, session, and torture. But sometimes they threaten the detainee with harassment, torture, solitary confinement before being told to sign. Uh, fourth, the rule of the lawyer begins with the start of the trials. Even uh, uh, the arrest will be long, long year, 10 year, five year. The role of the lawyer begin with the start of the trial, with the first session, uh, season, and sometime from the second season and of 
Of course, not all the detainees even have access to a lawyer. At this stage, what can a lawyer do? Uh, a, confession, a, a confession is considered the, the main source of evidence, but of the quality of the confessions. All that president, the, the five, all the president by lawyer at the stage has no value to the judge because sometimes the lawyer or defendant complains to the judge that this confession were ex extracted uh, by torture. The judge answer that there is no torture inside uh, the court and, the, and that he signed the confession voluntarily. So the lawyer cli claims uh, are commonly ignored. Six, the lawyer is not given access to the intercase file. Sometimes the file contain in uh, Saudi court notice of arrest, investigation document, uh, certified confession, report from various exp experts such as technical report to exam uh, the content of the mobile phone or laptop. For example, now there is uh, there is the case of 32 accused of spying Iran, which began in 21 February, last February. When the case was handed to the lawyer, the lawyer asked the judge to get access to the files. But the judge said, write your defense and then perhaps you can see it. In another cases, the judge said for another lawyer, I will not give you access in case you use it uh, to deny the charges. Seven, sometimes the lawyer is not allowed to visit the, 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 the defendant. For example, uh, Ali and Nimr, since the trial, 238 days from the start of the trial to the end. And from start of the trial to final appeal, it was a total 449 days. The total is 687 days without sitting with his lawyer. At the end, he sentences a death. Ali al rubah this guy, he arrested from chair of a school. He was in, uh, uh, he, he was in uh, last year before school, before university. They bring him from school. He was uh, executed in second of Yanayar with this mass execution 47. Also, Mustafa Abkar, the smallest one in 47 execution in 2nd of Yanayar, he was 13 or 14. He arrested from religion school while he take a lesson there. This is what happening uh, for some of the victims in 47, 2nd of Yanayar. Eight, the lawyer doesn't attend all season. They are not informed of meeting. Sometimes they find out by chance in the, uh, in the court. Uh, nine, the lawyer requests are ignored, especially when the lawyer requests a medical report, video footage, cameras of inter interrogation, bringing forth witness, bringing the arresting scud. 10, often the dialogue as we uh, as we written please in a uh, place instead of the oral place uh, 11 lawyer are prevented from giving statement to the media for example the lawyer for sheikh numar in 24 august before sentence sheikh numar in 15 october 2014 uh, he tweet he said uh, the judge today asked me, don't contact with media at all. After 52 days, Sheikh Namur get execution uh, sentences. Uh, in a tweet uh, prior uh, to the death sentence by 52 days, also the arrest of his brother, brother for Sheikh Namur, immediately after the verdict for nearly 12 days. But there was not legal reason for, the, for this. But some insiders believe that in order to prevent him communication, communicating with the media. Also, uh, number 12, uh, one of the new methods is re uh, threats towards lawyers. On 23 February, last February, two days after the start of the trial for those accused for spying for Iran, 
in which the public uh, prosecutor demand the execution of most of them, 25 uh, out of 32 demanding execution of them. Saudi newspaper, al Sharq al Awsat, wrote uh, in this issue uh, clear treaty sentences for uh, the lawyer. It said all the uh, prisoners, the uh, uh, authority, three lawyers. One of them, he uh, uh, he defending about terrorism man that Al Sheikh Nimr. This a clear treaty for all the lawyer they defending about uh, the arrest uh, for security issue in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Thirteen also there may be delay or uh, or obstruction for the accused to present his defense. For example, Sheikh Nimr prevent for one year to not present his defendant. Uh, Fourteen, last point. Failure to provide the required facilities in the case of 32 accused of spying for Iran. The judge gave them only 22 days uh, deadline for the submission of the defense, refusing to give an additional period despite there uh, being three years to prepare the public prosecutor Acquisition. So the role of the lawyer in Saudi Arabia for all this execution uh, is only formality, uh, formality. But one lawyer said their role in the court is just face it. They are uh, three like bobots. Uh, this is just a base, a, a basic principle of the trial. While the other principles, such as uh, a public trial, equality between. Uh, equality between the prosecution and the defense, and the right to a trial and court of component uh, uh, prosecution uh, and others. They are also not respect. Soon you will hear an example of this from the Saudi delegation and the consul more about the myth of their fire trial and then their fire execution at the end. Thank you, Ali. Just to sum up, what you have all three described is one of the worst uh, situations in the world in terms of the imposition of the death penalty, uh, but also in terms of the process, judicial process, and uh, the rights of the defense, and basically minimum international standards in relation to, to this. So, simple question before we move to, to the public. What can be done and what should be done, including by this council, to address the situation? What we saw with Alia Nimmer, who was supposed to be executed in January with the other 47, is that when the international community did speak out, when people made statements, when his case was in the public and in the news, it made it too hard for Saudi Arabia to carry out the execution. So I think, honestly, that the more noise in any format that we can get it will be helpful in resolving some of these cases, or at least getting some of them some more time. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think the Al Nima case was a very useful one to take stock of. From um, my perspective, you know, I'm looking around this room and I imagine there are people from lots of different countries and I think because Saudi Arabia wishes to have good relations, good economic relations, but also on matters of security uh, with lots of other states, I think it's really important that we call on our own respective countries to uphold a certain standard with Saudi Arabia that we would expect to see in our own countries. So if we don't want to see, you know, mass beheadings, then nor should our government be working with a government that openly uh, kills, you know, scores of people, or at least should be condemning that at every opportunity. And I think there are different things that one can do in relation to specific deals that are being done currently, trade deals, commercial, but also security deals, where pulling these into the sort of public domain and drawing attention to the fact that there that something is ongoing can encourage the governments that we're dealing with to speak out at the same time on the human rights situation. I think we need to use all the levers that we have. Actually, uh, I want to mention for uh, something uh, important in the last two years 
here in Human Rights Council regarding the uh, question for Nicholas also. Um, Actually, there is no any type of uh, supporting for the victims in Saudi Arabia before here in Human Rights Council uh, in general. Uh, but uh, last two years, there is uh, some NGO starting to support these victims. And also the state here, if we compare the first meeting with them uh, from more than one NGO, uh, they become now understanding more and more the situation in Saudi Arabia. For that, we want uh, thank all this NGO they are working during last two or three years in Saudi uh, situation uh, one of them and important of them EDHRB uh, and another also they are playing good role uh, actually here uh, and in this time uh, I will be happy to invite all NGOs here all uh, 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 media they are uh, focusing the human rights issue uh, uh, as a Saudi European organization uh, for human rights uh, to cooperate, we are ready for cooperate with any NGO they are interesting to support the victim in Saudi Arabia uh, also uh, any uh, uh, serious media they are uh, uh, interesting about the human rights issue in Saudi Arabia also uh, we will be happy to provide any state, any uh, 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 any mechanism in, in uh, OHCHR about any type of information. I say that one because actually uh, in the next uh, few years we will not uh, uh, thinking there is a lot of change will be in Saudi Arabia maybe after few years but in the next one or two years there is a lot of difficulties for civil society in Saudi Arabia and same time there is a lot of cases need support. For that, this uh, open invitation for any NGO, for any uh, 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 side they are interesting about the human rights in Saudi Arabia. And thank you for all attendance, for all supporters. Thank you very much, and please join me to thank our panelists today.